and welcome to another booktube video from me, Martha May Books. Today I have for you quite a fun reading vlog. I'm excited. I said in my October TBR that I would be reading Gods and Warriors by Michelle Paver. I love Michelle Paver. If you have watched almost any of my videos, I will have mentioned her. She's my favourite author. I'll give you a bit of backstory about me and Michelle Paver. So Michelle Paver wrote The Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, which I started reading, I think, when I was nine and continue to love to this day. They are my favourite book series. They were my favourite book series <laughs> since I started reading them to now. Does that explain how much I love them? A lot of the things that I have going on in my life are because of the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. I also have read all of her ghost stories, um, which I also love very much. So she is my favourite author. However, and here's the skeleton in my closet, I have never read an entire series by her because I was salty and I feel like it's time to fix that. I want to read Gods and Warriors this month. So this is the first book in the Gods and Warriors series. I think later they changed the name to The Outsiders. I received this for Christmas 2012. Ghost Hunter had just come out which was the last book in the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness and I was salty because Michelle Paver had abandoned me in a Toracless world. Torax, the main character of Chronicles, if you don't know. And then this book came out, which follows a boy in the Bronze Age, I think. And I was salty because she had moved on. She started writing a new book series with no regard for my feelings. How dare she? And so I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna read it, don't wanna read it. But this month I want to read Gods and Warriors, The Burning Shadow, Eye of the Falcon, I think it's called the third one, then The Crocodile Tomb, and finally Warrior Bronze. All of the books in Gods and Warriors this month. We're gonna do it, and in fact, not even this month, in the next three days because I get three days off from work in a row, kind of like a long weekend, and I'm gonna spend that long weekend, you're not part of this bitter orange, I'm gonna spend this long weekend reading a whole book series that I probably would have loved as a child if I wasn't such a salty little beast. So that's what I'm gonna do. Sorry, can I just say this is such a good first sentence and the salty little Martha who was like 13 years old was like, no thank you. The shaft of the arrow was black and fletched with crow feathers, but Hilias couldn't see the head because it was buried in his arm. I mean, the woman knows how to start a book. Hello, so I have just read the first um, like 40 pages of this, but I'm enjoying it so far. I don't remember anything that's happened so far. All I remember from this is at some point he sees a woman by a boat and that's it. But I'm enjoying it. So what it seems to be about is um, this guy called Hilias, Hylas? I don't know how to pronounce it. This guy Hylas is an outsider on, it seems to be kind of part of Greece. And an outsider is a person who's born outside of a village so they haven't got the protection of the village and they're kind of all alone. And he's got a sister and a dog and a friend but his sister is missing his dog is dead and his friend abandons him not in a nasty way to like save him and help with the mission yeah so Hilias is being attacked by these guys who are called the crows who like paint their bodies with ash and wear bronze and he's being like hunted down by them because they want to kill all of the outsiders for some reason so there's such a cute pigeon outside um, yeah, so that's what I've discovered about this so far. It's very fast paced so far as well, which I feel like Michelle Paver's books, her like children's books normally are, like with all of Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, it always starts with like some sort of chase or an escape or something like that, something really intense and kind of keeps up the pace the whole way through. So I am enjoying it so far. I can completely see why Salty 13 year old me did not want to read this though because it's very Chronicles so it follows a boy who's 12 years old like Chronicles um he like forages for food which is 
has always been one of my favourite parts of Chronicles is like the details of him, of Torak and Ren and how they kind of gather food and how, you know, that's, you know, what they would do. And also he is given like a special knife that he has to keep hidden, which also happens in Chronicles. I'm not saying that she's like ripping herself off or anything, but I can see why at 13, when I was still grieving the loss of Chronicles, why I would be like salty and not want to read about this boy who's like similar to Torak, but we aren't in the Stone Age anymore. Here's a development. We've got a point of view from a dolphin. In Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, we get a point of view from, there's such a cute bird in the garden. I know I said there was a cute pigeon last time, but this is a cute little bird. I thought it was a frog initially. Yeah, so in Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, we get a point of view from Wolf, who is Torak's wolf companion, and he finds him as a cub in a flood, and all of his pack is drowned, and Wolf is there, and they can kind of they have an understanding with one another. And here we have a dolphin's point of view. So that's fun. I think that initially when I was younger, I didn't really like this because I, I didn't think dolphins were rubbish. I'm not saying that no shade to a dolphin, but I think that I um, was like, dolphins aren't as good as wolves and was literally just salty because the animal that we were hearing from was a dolphin and I didn't like that. I was such a salty child that I was like, I'm not gonna read this book because it's not got a wolf in it that tells me its thoughts. I'm on page 123, 123. I'm now further than I got when I was younger and I was trying to read this for the first time. Where I got to when I was younger and I was reading this was that Hylas uh, being hunted by these crow warriors and he, sees a priestess on the shore and that was as far as I got. Um, so in this book we follow Hylas whose sister Izzy and him are separated by these warriors because they're outsiders and they're being hunted. We're also following Telamon who is Hylas's best friend who's son of a chieftain and we're following I think she's called P Pyria? Paria? Something like that. Um, and she is like a holy woman's daughter and she's like literally never been outside in her whole life and so we're following like all of these characters and also a dolphin that has some knowledge that it needs to help Hylas do something. Just now I have read about 60 pages past where I got to when I was younger because that was around page, page 60 that I DNF'd it eight years ago and now what's happened is Hylas is just spent a very scary amount of time being hunted by a shark whilst he was on the water and I need to find out what this girl's name is because like I'm just gonna keep getting it wrong otherwise. Pyrrha, priestess's daughter, is going to be in an arranged marriage with Telamon but she's decided she doesn't want to be in an arranged marriage and so she has escaped and Hylas and Pyrrha are now together. I'm enjoying it a lot more than I did last time. I think I genuinely, it was all the salt because I was seeing so many like similarities between like Hylas and Torak. Um, like they're really great trackers, they're both really determined, they both got an animal companion. Um, and I was just salty. I was just being a salty beast. The bonding is happening. The bonding is happening. I'm gonna have to stop doing these updates like so often if I actually wanna finish the book. But I've got a lot to say because I'm still getting into it. And also because it's like a children's book, it's quite fast paced. Here I am saying they're bonding, but he says Pyrrha like burnt her face because she was hoping it would stop the wedding that she was gonna have to have. Um, it didn't. But it says he considered fetching some mallow root for a poultice then decided against it. She'd helped save spirit, but that didn't make her a friend. He hadn't forgotten that her people were in league with the crows. Besides, how could they be friends when he had to leave her behind? He felt increasingly bad about that, but there didn't seem to be any other way. Okay, just when I was starting to like this boy, he's saying he's gonna abandon her. I am on page 212, which means that I only have about 80 pages left of this book. I am very intrigued. It's very creepy. There's potentially demons in this really burnt ravine. There's people in caves that have been buried in stone and kind of like the people of Pompeii where they're like bodies. You can just see their bodies in stone. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by it. Also, what I find with the magic system in um, <laughs> my empty lounge, um, what I find with the magic system in Chronicles and in this so far is that you could easily explain the magic system through science and through like knowledge of nature but you can also 
just accept the magic system and accept the character's belief in that. For example, like the sea glows blue when the goddess is involved, but also the sea can grow blue with certain bacteria. I finished it. I finished the first book, often called Gods and Warriors, sometimes called The Outsiders, not completely sure on the title change at the moment. But the copy that I've got says Gods and Warriors, so that's what I'm going to go with. I really enjoyed this and I'm glad that I read it and I'm definitely excited to read the next book in the series. For me, it hasn't quite reached the heights of Chronicles yet, but then at the same time, I read Chronicles when I was the right age for it. I love walls and forests and the stone age in general. Chronicles has had more time to like imprint on my soul. I've just finished book one of Gods and Warriors known as Gods and Warriors and The Outsiders. I would give this between four and five stars. I'm not completely sold on the characters, the story yet. I like them but because I keep comparing them to Chronicles, like the characters from Chron the characters from Chronicles, I'm still kind of like struggling to like get massively invested. The other thing is that the animal companion in this book is a dolphin called Spirit, who is a sweetheart, but, and it's acknowledged in the book, is that a dolphin is a difficult animal companion to have because humans can't be underwater for a long time and dolphins can't come out of the water. So, it's acknowledged that it's not like the best relationship one could hope for, but they do their best. The other thing is, it was very creepy, which I liked. There were very creepy moments where they were in the caves and when they were in the valley, the burnt valley with all of the demons going on. But <laughs> again, it was just, I know I keep comparing it to the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness and this book to Wolf Brother. I think that will stop once I move into the later books because maybe this is just how Michelle Paver writes the opening to a historical fantasy children's book series is like with a plot like this and the plot isn't similar at all like it's not like oh um Hylas has to go to an ice like mountain no it's just they follow similar milestones I just feel like in Wolf Brother I felt more immediately attached to the characters whereas in this it they take a bit more warming up to on the island he ends up with Pyrrha he, for a long time, even when he views her in a friendly way, intends to leave her behind on the island. But then again in Wolf Brother, initially, Torak thinks about eating Wolf for survival. So it's not... I don't know what quite what it is. I don't know whether it was just that I like liked those characters more, and if I felt more sympathetic to them, but I just felt like I got in Wolf Brother more of an immediate idea of the kind of world that we were in and the kind of characters that we were dealing with. But at the same time, this is at the start of the Bronze Age in Greece, I think, where some people are using stone tools still and they're making a change to bronze. So I don't know whether that feeling of not quite knowing what's going on, like the, the setting, is because of the massive change that's going on in the world because like in the Stone Age, you're like, cool, I'm in the Stone Age, I know what's happening. Whereas here, I was trying to pinpoint like what was going on more. But I did enjoy it. I know it sounds like I didn't, but I did. It was a fun story and I did like the characters. It was just like when you compare them to like Ren Torek and Wolf, no comparison. But then at the same time, I have read Chronicles each book at least five times. So how do you compare to that on a first read? Next I have The Burning Shadow. So this is the second book. Looks like they've got a lion with them this time so maybe the dolphin relationship situation won't carry on into this book because I wasn't sure how that was going to work throughout the series because once they're away from the ocean how does a dolphin become involved in their story? It seems like we're not gonna have a dolphin in this book we're gonna have a lion. That's interesting. I wonder with the other ones. Yeah so it's a different Oh no. Oh no, maybe a lion sticks around. Maybe Michelle Weber was like, oh wait, I've written this whole book about a lovely dolphin, but unfortunately for me, I don't want the whole rest of my series to be set by the ocean, so don't think we're gonna keep this dolphin character. Hello. Okay, I'm just gonna look like this, um, like some sort of bog woman. Okay, so 
I am about 50 pages in, 77 pages into The Burning Shadow by Michelle Paver. I'm enjoying it. Okay, so in this book, Hylas is kidnapped by, look, it's just, it's, it's bad, ignore it. Hylas is kidnapped by some slavers who are mining copper because this is the Bronze Age and everyone is excited I always miss this one piece of hair. This is the Bronze Age and everyone's excited for bronze and they need copper and tin, because that's bronze. Personally, I've not seen any bronze as of late. I wonder if it's still a thing. So yeah, I'm 77 pages in, I'm really enjoying it. So I've just got to the point where Hylas has been kidnapped by these slavers and he is working in the mines and there's like really spooky, like what I love about Michelle Paper's books, even the children's ones, is that there are such spooky like one line where then you're like, Oh my god, that's horrifying. So it's just like a horrifying thing, but it's just like slightly hinted at. So in this, like in the last book in the series, there was the thing about Pyrrha having to climb over stone corpses to escape the cave. Spooky. In And like that probably will never be explained. We just have to accept that. In this book, um, the thing that really spooked me out last night when I was reading it was that there's a grade of people in the copper mines who they're put down in a pit that they can't climb out of and they're never let out. Like people go in there and then they just work in there till they die. How horrifying. So, um, but I'm really enjoying it. Oh yeah, so Pyrrha has just also got to the island that Hylas is a slave on and she has gone there pretending to be a slave of a woman that she trusted called Hecabe to help her escape from the palace because she doesn't want to get married off again because that's what her mother is planning on doing to her. Pyrrha I feel like is slightly improved in this book. She's getting more of like Wren-like qualities where she is a little bit cleverer because um, in the first book she was pretty pathetic whereas in this one she's been like practicing because she knows that she is going to escape and go into the wilderness and so she is being a little bit cleverer and a little bit more sneaky. And I'm enjoying reading it. I'm halfway through. I'm really enjoying it. I love these characters. I'm much preferring the lion cub over the dolphin. So where I'm up to at the moment, Hylas, who was a slave in the copper mines, has now escaped and has done all sorts of stuff with demons because one of the boys in his troop of pit spiders ha was possessed by demons and he was really creepy. And so the demons in this are really interesting and also they seem to be working for the crows, which is also interesting because it's reminiscent of the soul eaters from Chronicles because the soul eaters are trying to control the demons. So that's fun. And Hylas and Pyrrha have just reunited in the wilderness this time, not in captivity. I am gonna keep reading. I want to try and finish this today, but I've got another 140 pages to read. Pyrrha's just had to kill a dog that was hunting them. And it says, I've never killed anything. What, never? They stared at each other. Yeah, she has. Um, she killed the sea urchins in the last book. Maybe she means like, you know, like a beast with a face and stuff, but she's killed sea urchins. Yeah, so the lion cub, um, who is the animal companion in this book, and I think she'll continue to be the animal companion Throughout the rest of the series, I think um, Michelle Paver has canned the dolphin. The lion cub is called Havoc, and I think that is such a cute name. I'm so sad. The lion is in peril. Oh, I have just finished The Burning Shadow. I love this book. Such a good time. Definitely prefer Havoc over Spirit, just because as I've said before, I don't think a dolphin's a very good animal companion because they can't really help you that well. I'm really looking forward to getting to the next book to see what happens to all the characters. Pyrrha and Havoc are together uh, and Hylas is off with the slaves after the volcanic eruption. And Telamon, what a serpent. So I have the next book on my iPad. I don't have it in physical form. So I'm going to probably cook some dinner and then start that. I've just started The Eye of the Falcon, which is book three of the Gods and Warriors series. I am on page 19 of 272 and I have just read quite a funny little passage. So uh, what's happened is Hylas has 
sailed to Keftiu, which is where Pira and Havoc should be. Ooh, it's my dinner alarm. And he sailed there with the other escaped slaves. And they've gotten there and it's deserted and there's plague. And uh, so the slaves drop him off because that's what he wants. And he is all alone on this island until he discovers some people who are dying wool. And it said, these people must be dye workers, but why would anyone bother to dye wool in a plague? And it reminded me of um, the pandemic and how everyone got very crafty during it. So, you know, maybe people would do that, hi lass. Maybe people would. I am now almost 50% through and Pira has an animal companion too. Love this. Hylas has this dagger in the first book and there's a prophecy that says that if the dagger of the House of Koronos is wielded by an outsider, then the House of Koronos will fall. And that's why they were killing all the outsiders and they, every book, there's kind of like a last stand to protect the dagger from the House of Koronos and they always seem to end up with it and there's always like a big battle. So the end of the second book, Pyrrha, takes the dagger and hides it and keeps it and she's just told Hylas in this book that she has hidden the dagger in the house of the goddess and that they need to get there before the crows get there so that they can destroy it and make the house of Coronus fall and the reason they have to do this is because they're evil and they consort with demons and they want to take over the whole world. But she also said that even if the crows search for 10 years, they wouldn't find it in the hiding place. So I'm not quite sure what the rush is because they say like, oh, we've got to get there. Even if we end up, like the crows might find our trail and they end up following us there, which is a bit weird to me because I feel like you could probably hide out in the wilderness for a year, wait until the crows are like, oh, okay, there's no dagger here. Let's leave and then go to the house of the goddess. Just my personal feelings. Hello, it's all got a bit home alone. I've had a realization in the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, the through story is that Torak and Ren and Wolf have to fight the Soul Eaters and that the Soul Eaters want to hurt him. And it's similar in this, in that Hylas has to fight the crows and that they want to kill him. But the difference is that we've got this knife that they're always after, whereas in Chronicles they're just always after Torak and they have their different ways of doing it and that's kind of the fun and the mystery. Whereas in this, because it's the knife, it's actually quite frustrating for me, just the way that I like stories to be, because it's like, oh, we have the knife. Oh no, we've lost it. Oh, we've got it again. Oh, now someone's taken it. It's just something that I know that I'm not a massive fan of in series where it's kind of like you have one objective and it keeps getting kind of scuppered throughout the series. So I'll see how I feel about it in the next couple of books as well. I have just finished The Eye of the Falcon, which is book three of the Gods and Warriors series by Michelle Gaver. I really liked it. I think I'm gonna give this one five stars. I gave the last one five stars as well. I had a little word with myself and I was like, you can't just give it f like four stars just cause it's not Chronicles. I would give it five stars, but it's not Chronicles. So I'm gonna give it four. And it's like, well, it's not its fault that it's not Chronicles. I'm now gonna read The Crocodile Tomb, which is book four and this one is set in Egypt because they're going looking for Pyrrha's slave and it says that they're gonna have to go into the realms of the dead. I wonder how that will be for Hylas and his whole I can see ghosts adventure thing. Hello it's me I'm on page 186 and the title has just become relevant. I love this moment. They knew the crocodile tomb well. <gasps> After all of my dithering and not doing the thing I was meant to be doing, I finally finished Crocodile Tomb. And I finished it the day that I intended to finish it. So what happened with this was I read to like page 40 and then completely lost interest. And then the next day I read a hundred and no, 250 pages and stayed up till two in the morning to finish it. So you know, it definitely caught my attention again. So this is the fourth Gods and Warriors and they're in Egypt, as I've said. So what happens in this one, spoilers, is that Pyrrha's slave and very close friend, Yusuref, uh, has returned to Egypt, believing that she's dead with the dagger of Koronos. And he has then died 
at the hands of the crows and is buried in a tomb by his family but the dagger of Koronos has been buried with him. Pyrrha and Hylas have to create a plot and a scheme to get the dagger back. They also have to learn how to survive in Egypt. I have had literal nightmares that I was like walking the banks of the ancient Nile with Hylas and Pyrrha trying to avoid crocodiles. There's also quite a lot in here with Hylas and his ability to see ghosts and spirits and gods. He can see all the gods of Egypt and it was really interesting because as I said before I really like Egyptian history I don't know very much about it but I'm interested in it and so it was interesting to see kind of a fantasy spin on it. I gave this four stars rather than five I think there was just because of my initial lack of interest in it I'm just I'm kind of reaching the point with this series where I'm ready to be done with it because it doesn't feel like there's so much progress I'm gonna put this down now because I'm just talking about the series as a whole where comparing it to Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, this is spoilers for Chronicles and Gods and Warriors, pretty much, not every book, but almost every book in Chronicles, a Soul Eater dies. And Torak is fighting the Soul Eaters. And so when in every book a Soul Eater dies, it feels like progress because you're like, right, one down, like <laughs> three to go. You know, it feels like you're getting somewhere with the fight. Whereas in this series, in Gods and Warriors, Hylas is fighting the crows and Pyrrha is also fighting the crows and Telamon is a crow, used to be Hylas's best friend. And it doesn't really feel like we're getting anywhere with what their goals are because we're like, we're getting a lot of character development. We're also, can I just say in this book, getting a lot of Pyrrha and Hylas being like, oh, I kind of fancy them but what, like, <laughs> I'm too awkward, which is cute. But we're not getting a lot of like, forwarding in their goals and plot and it feels like we're being set backwards, which happens in life, but it's just frustrating to read when you're on the fourth book of a series and we're in exactly the same place we were at the start, goal-wise, character-wise, very different, but like, for their goals. So Hylas still hasn't, made any progress in his search for Issy. The dagger of Koronos is still in the hands of the crows. So it just feels like, like, where's the progress? Not that I'm not enjoying it, I am enjoying it, but it just feels a bit, and like, I, I think it's because Torak's goal was to destroy the Soul Eaters, like, and one by one, he has to thwart their individual plans because they work individually. And so each time a Soul Eater has an evil scheme, he's like, ah, you're a Soul Eater. I'm gonna do things and defeat you. Whereas because the crows are working as a whole and it's just this one dagger, I understand that to get a five book series out of it, the dagger has to keep changing hands and eventually at the end of every book, pretty much end up back with the crows so that we can have another adventure. But <laughs> it's just frustrating when it doesn't feel like there's really any progress in the goals. Like they went all the way to Egypt to get this dagger and now we're back all the way back in Ikea or whatever it's called for Warrior Bronze. So I am 12 pages into Warrior Bronze, which is the final book in the Gods and Warriors series. And Spirit has returned. Spirit is the dolphin from the first book, Gods and Warriors, that we have not seen since. And Spirit has returned. He has frightened some crows away from Hylas and Pyrrha's hiding place. And now he's disappeared again. I wonder if we'll see him again. I'm on page 93 and I have a theory that Telamon is gonna come back over to the good side because all through the book he's been motivated by like making his father proud by like making his grandfather proud trying to become a man and to be a strong warrior and Hylas has just seen Telamon's dad's ghost act disappointed in him and he's told Telamon and they've had a fight and I'm wondering and then Telamon uh, is being like hunted by the angry ones, the demons, because he killed his aunt and the demons will hunt you if you killed a family member. And he's like having doubts about the whole situation, I think. 
So my theory is that Telamon is going to come back and be good. Because also on the back it says, only if old friends and new friends join forces. <gasps> oh, and also we've had potential news of Issy. The news is that Hecabee from book two, who's like a wise woman, uh, now lives in the marshes and she's got a little child that they think everyone thinks is a spirit that like sabotages the crows and i think and so also does hylas that it's issy but everyone else thinks issy is dead so we shall see but i'm i'm enjoying this because it actually feels like we're making some progress we are looking for issy finally um and also it's the final book so things are gonna have to conclude Oh, and Pyrrha might be eaten by a lion. So I'm gonna get back to reading and see if she gets eaten by a lion. Hi lass is so awkward. Okay, so we're in the last, like, I'm in the last under 10 pages um, of the last book. And one of um, Hi lass's wishes that he gives to the high chieftain as a reward for all of his work against the crows. <laughs> is that Jinx, the horse from the first book, can be set free with a mate, which like he's super awkward about to Pira. But they like run off into the meadow, the horses, and it says, Havoc appeared out of nowhere and rubbed against his thigh. She cast an indifferent eye on the horses, having recently made a kill. Imagine if they do this like beautiful, like let's set the horses free, and then Havoc just murdered them. Anyway, the other thing I want to say is that Telemon's a massive idiot and um, I'm going to keep reading. I finished it! I thought I had 10 pages left, but I had one page left. I finished the whole series! I really liked it. Like, I gave them all, like, four or five stars. Yeah, I really liked it. It's just not Chronicles. And that is the sad fact of it. But you know maybe if if they'd been written the other way around and this had been written and then chronicles maybe i'd be reading chronicles now and being like it's just not gods and warriors first of all i want to say thank you and also well done you for getting to the end of my very long very self-indulgent reading vlog it's much later after i read the gods and warriors series now but i wanted to do a little outro little conclusion to the experiment which to be fair, I think the last clip summed up quite well, which is, I really enjoyed it, but it's not Chronicles. I think the characters are great. I think the story's great. I do agree with myself from midway through the reading vlog, who was feeling quite frustrated about the repetition and the fact that the knife keeps changing hands and we make no progress. However, I do think that also that frustration comes from the fact that Hylas has goals and that he wants to find Izzy, his sister. Those are goals that Torak didn't really have because Torak's whole goal is destroy the Soul Eaters and that's it. So I don't know whether that makes Hylas more of an interesting character because he does have goals or whether it makes him more frustrating because the whole time he's fighting the crows he's not looking after his nine-year-old sister. I did really enjoy this and maybe it will inspire one of you guys to read a series that you didn't read because you were salty because I had a great time. So thank you for watching. Let me know down below if there's ever been a series or a book that you didn't read because you were being petty about something because I'd love to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> My dog's being very cute. I'm gonna go now, put this on the end of the video and upload it. Goodbye.